Now I'd like to introduce you to someone who you may have seen on the news a few months ago. Many of you know him as the man at the airport, Syrian refugee Hassan al Kantar. He spent seven months stuck in an airport arrival terminal at Kuala Lumpur at the international airport in Malaysia. His story became an international media sensation when he tried to find a way to escape his predicament. Hassan is committed to advocating for refugees around the world using the creative, upbeat approach that made him beloved by thousands of people. Hassan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. I hope you are all safe and doing well in this difficult time. This is my first virtual speech ever. I hope I look handsome as I do in real life. They call me the man from the airport, but my name is Hassan and I'm from Syria. For those who don't know the story, let me summarize the highlights. In October 2017, an immigration police officer escorted me in handcuffs from UAE detention to the Abu Dhabi International Airport. From there, they deported me to Malaysia. In April 2018, my visa in Malaysia had expired, and I tried to fly to Ecuador and then Cambodia, both countries that were officially accepting Syrian at the time and yet I was rejected, each time for a different reason. I ended up back in the airport in Kuala Lumpur where I lived for seven months. In October 2018, more than 12 police officers escorted me in handcuffs from Kuala Lumpur International Airport to police station and from there to jail. They told me I was a threat to their national security. In each of these incidents, I was treated like a criminal subjected to handcuffs, fingerprints, photos from the side and the front, insults, humiliations. In each of these incidents, my only crime and offense was of being Syrian. My story as I see it is the story of each hopeless and powerless Syrian cursed by war and uncaring war. It's the story of other refugees in, other, in, in refugee camps and prisons in Greece, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and in the islands offshore of Australia, who are desperate to be here and for the world to start take actions. It's the story of the families, including my own family, who are still living on fear. The Syrian security forces, who are the source of so much torture and suffering, are still showing in my family home asking about me. It's the story of an ancient, lovely, civilized, cultured country, ripped apart by war, blood, hatred, ignorance and revenge. It's the story of how politics and governments keep a balance sheet of wins and loses, money and power, but never see the human beings who are being the price of their games. It's the story of a disparate solution and how to turn adversity into a source of creativity and strength. It's the story of a human soul and how each of us can turn into the hero we always hope to meet. It's the story of the social media, and how media is a double-edged sword, which can draw attention to the powerless or become a weapon of a mass destruction. It's the story of individuals who have choice and how it's never too late to make a difference. It's the story about international law and how the rules that govern countries have failed us. My story is the story of a country we call Canada and of a people we call Canadians. It's the story that could be titled The Man at the Airport, or maybe One Man's Story, A Nation's Tragedy. The era of COVID-19, where we have all had a taste of living in lockdown, has had some interesting consequences. Many people now have a glimpse of the reality of for many refugees, who are denied for their freedom to work or even move freely. The situations are not the same but there are connections. When I was detained in Malaysia, threatened to be sent back to Syria, death was always on my mind. And now it's on everyone's mind. Each time we go outside and make the mistake of, of shaking the hand of a friend. So welcome to the mind of refugee, everyone. Welcome to the dark place where the dead are not people, just numbers on spreadsheets to a place where you go to sleep or wake up to the news of a tragedy that never goes away. 
to the feeling of fear, insecurity, and an inability to read the future. To be separated from your family with no clue as to when you will see them again. To have loved ones die without being able to say goodbye. To feel the world's airport forbidding for you and the airlines forbidding you from boarding. To see the world's borders closing to you and your passport not worth the paper it's printed on. To feel trapped and unwelcome. To ask the question that you should never ask because no one has the answer. When will all this end? It's a difficult time, yes, but it's also a hopeful one. The health crisis and the pressures it creates has set the stage of other type of protests. We now see a rising against racism, discrimination, and dictatorships all over the world. This ability to find the light in the darkness, strength in the time of adversity, is a sign of hope for humanity. It's just another proof that the struggle for human rights is universal and connect us all. That the dream for freedom and justice will never die. And the day will come where we will celebrate our happiness and sense of belonging together. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. It's great to hear your story. It's a remarkable, remarkable one and quite extraordinary. If you're able to stay on camera just for a minute, we have a few questions that we would love to, to talk with you about. Um, that would be great. So I noticed from your social media and that you live in Whistler that you love the wildlife up there. Uh, nice, easy question to start with. What's your favorite of the Canadian wildlife you've seen? Because I know you've seen a lot. Uh, bears, mm -hmm. deers, uh, it's an amazing to be in Whistler actually, because for us, those who lived on the edge and played with death for so many years in their life, life become equal to quietness and peace. Mm -hmm. And that's what Whistler provides us. It's not just a ski resort, it's a quiet place and uh, it's lovely to be here actually. Good. And is it true that you've named one of the bears? Yeah, his name is Balo <laughs> and he's a friend of mine. Good. <laughs> At a so safe social distance, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying, but he's living on my roof, so it's hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that would make, maybe you're not the man at the airport anymore, you're the man with a bear on his roof. <laughs> well, I will be always the man from the airport, even <laughs> if I forget about him, he's not going to forget about me, so I made my peace with it. It's true, it's true. So Hassan, we've had a question from one of our audience members. Uh, what is the best way for their refugee friends who came to Australia and are still there after seven years in Papua New Guinea and Nauru to find five sponsors for private sponsors to come to Canada? That's a tough question. Well, uh, it's a tough, but um, we start uh, almost seven or eight months ago an operation we called Not Forgetting. It's a partnership with Mosaic in, in uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the aim is to sponsor up to 200, 250 refugees who have been declined from uh, accepting from USA. Uh, so far, I believe they submitted 60 uh, applications. So that's the only situation we have. It's going to be a long process, almost two to uh, two half years with a lot of money. We need uh, three to 3.5 million, uh, but um, someone need to do it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Australia refusing to accepting them or to let any other country helps. Uh, and that's the only solution. So uh, we are not forgetting them. Um, Good. Just hold, hold, hold up there. Okay, and and so the best way to find out about that is to contact Mosaic in Vancouver, right? Yes, uh, they have an online form, and they uh, the technical people will get uh, uh, in touch with them. Great, good stuff. Okay, um, another question, and and also if you don't want to answer any of these questions, feel free to pass on them. That's no problem at all. So we do have a question about the 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 criminal charges that the police tried to apply to you. What were they? Uh, in Malaysia? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I don't uh, like uh, turn off any question. People has the right to ask okay. and they have the right to know. So it's okay. Uh, and uh, they told me that I have been a threat to their national security, a great uh, source of embarrassing to the nation. And then yet they did not find any criminal, uh, any, 
any criminal uh, uh, offenses. That's why they handled me to immigration, as they said that I have stayed more than 14 days in a, a not allowed or a forbidden area at the airport. But that was just an excuse. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. uh, they had enough from all the media attention and all uh, the criticizing they were getting. So they decided to end it. Wow. So, I mean, um, living in the airport meant living day to day, that you had to take each day as it came. How, how is it now that you think about the future? And what kind of plans and dreams do you have? Because now you're able to think beyond the day to day. Yes. Uh, well, uh, at the airport, there's no easy days. There are hard days and legendary hard days. Um, with two types of problems. The main one is how to get out myself out uh, outside the airport and mm -hmm. the daily routine problems, which you never think that it will be a problem in, in your life. Uh, how to take a shower, what to eat, uh, where to sleep, how to clean your clothes, where to dry them. Uh, but with time, you will start finding the keys and the answers. Um, what I think of about the future, I understand life in a, from a different perspective now. I believe that it's not about only about what you want, but it's also about what you have. Because what you have is the impossible dream for millions and millions around the globe. And that's the thing we have in Canada. That, that's why we should be thankful and grateful because millions of people wish to be here. And I'm still dealing with hundreds of them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, for now, I'm planning my future. I'm secure, I'm safe, I have work, I have proof above my head. So what's the worst that could happen? I'm in Canada, permanent residence, so I'm taking it easy. Good, good. Yeah, I'm working on a book and hopefully uh, soon it will be there. Good, you, that was gonna be one of my questions, so yeah. that's great. Um, Hassan, uh, you seem to be a great advocate for uh, refugees. This is a question from one of our audience, but how much of your advocacy time do you spend speaking or advocating for refugees not from Syria? That's an interesting question, thank you. Uh, well, actually the operation we start, the not forgetting one, none of them is Syrian. We have 200 to 240 and none of them is Syrian. I believe in human rights I, uh, and a kind of global citizenship. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you are Syrian or not. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation or your uh, color of your skin. As long as you are a human, you have the right to live, to be safe and to work. Mm -hmm. But really? I'm also from Syria and that's a part of my uh, childhood. And uh, that's where I'm from. So, and with the uprising these days, starting again in Syria, especially in my hometown, Suida city, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm spending much time to focus there as well. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we had is, um, someone noticed that you have a tattoo of an airplane on your arm. What yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that's a tattoo and, uh, with the world map. And this world is uh, freedom in Arabic. So, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Good. So I always I, wanted one, actually. So. <laughs> and did you have it done when you got to Canada? Yeah, uh, like uh, six or seven months ago. Excellent. Yeah. So um, what would you say you found about the most challenging things about living in Canada? It's a new culture. Mm. And um, you need your, uh, uh, to find your own way around uh, everything, to know the system, how things are working. But in general, Canada and the Canadian people, they are kind, generous, um, and uh, they are helping a lot. They are offering uh, uh, a lot of help, actually. Mm. And so they are making things easy for me. Um, I'm used to the Western culture uh, since I was a kid. Um, I used to watch like from the TV movies, songs. So it's not that difficult for me, but it's still difficult for so, some of the families, Syrian families or other refugee families who are coming. So uh, that's where we need help for people for their, with their kids and uh, for the, uh, our senior people. Um, and hopefully we will we can like focus on that area because they have still facing some kind of integration problem. Um, another question: um, What message do you have to the community that banded together to change your life and allow resettlement to Canada possible? 
they changed my, uh, they restart my belief in humanity, actually, mm. people who have choices in their life to enjoy uh, uh, their nationalities, to travel all, all across the world, yet they decide to save lives. And uh, that's when I, uh, I'm not a huge fan of governments in general, not because they are all dictators, but because I believe there's always a room for more. Mm. And uh, that's where individual with the social media and all the technology, individuals, they have the power to lead the change now and to be the change, to create the wave. Uh, all what they want to do is to believe in themselves and um, to touch the lives. And that's why uh, people describe hope as the uh, light at the end of the dark tunnel. For yeah. me, it has faces. It has the faces of uh, uh, Mrs. Laurie Cooper, the, my Canadian mother who uh, uh, helped me, uh, um, Mr. Andrew Brower, uh, lawyer, and so many other, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, so many other people. So yeah. I have a face for the hope now. That's great to hear. So uh, another question coming in, Hassan, in your opinion, how can we create more spaces for refugees to advocate on their own behalf and tell their stories in their own voices? That's my main issue, actually, because mm -hmm. what I know is that even with the organization, NGOs or uh, settlement organizations, uh, they still look to us as victims or people who suffered a lot in their life. So uh, it's uh, our time now to, to enjoy life. And mm -hmm. sometimes we offer ourselves, uh, use us, put us in the front lines. We know the mentality. We know how to deal with people. Let us help. But they are still, um, well, uh, it is what it is. But they are still looking to us as victims. Um, we are enthusiastic. Uh, we are full of energy and we need to help. So use us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, that's, and we are educated people, uh, cultured and skilled workers. So we could be an, an additional value to this community. Totally agree. So Hassan, um, a question, how are you integrating into the community in Whistler? Well, Whistler is a lovely place. It's, uh, it's reminding me of uh, an old uh, children book my family used to read to me, my parents, when I was a kid, uh, Heidi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, um, they are lovely people, everyone from somewhere else. Yes. And um, people are uh, trying to enjoy their life. They are kind. They are polite. Um, not lately with the COVID-19, it's a little bit sad. It, become more like a ghost uh, town, mm -hmm. but things are start uh, uh, launching up, like start up again. Uh, hopefully with a few months, it will, it will be Whistler that I knew. Uh, okay. I tried, I moved to Vancouver for three months the last mm -hmm. summer. I love Vancouver and I uh, lived in an area, beautiful area, Catsalano, mm -hmm. but I always felt that Whistler will be always my first Canadian home. And uh, I went, so I came back. I could not stay there. <laughs> Good. Um, last question, if we may, is um, having lived through the extraordinary time that you've lived um, and your, the, the extraordinary events that you've lived, what would be your message to those attending to this, attending this event and to the wider world? We have people from all over the world joining us today. So what would be your message to them? As I said, it's a difficult time, but it's a, a time full of hope. And uh, uh, we need to look into the half full uh, of the glass. Uh, mm. With the COVID-19, with all the protests, with all the Black Lives Matter, we also need to uh, um, take care of the internal issues we have here in Canada, such like, like uh, the indigenous rights mm. uh, or the refugees. Uh, what we need them to, uh, to start looking to us as a Canadian members, because so far, even with me, uh, the way they introduced me, the former Syrian refugee. Uh, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of being Syrian, but I also want to be proud of being a Canadian. So I want them to start look to us as a Canadian members and uh, to let us help. Mm -hmm. Great. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of everybody here. We're proud to have you in Canada. Thank you Canadian. very much. So I'm proud to be Thank here. you so much for sharing you. your story you. today. We really, appreciate really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank um, you. And we look forward to watching your journey as you settle because it's going to be interesting for sure. And I know that you'll have at least 300 people who will buy your book when you, uh, when you have it for sale. So. Oh, well, that's a great sell. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know and we'll do our best to publicize it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And for now, um, I'm going to ask.